Clone characters have been a part of many realms of fiction, and with many characters, there may or may not be a clone or counterpart of some sort associated. Whether it be a small-time clone with no real significance to the overall story, or one destined to just be killed off, or one who sticks around and stays relevant for better or worse, here, I'll be going through a few clone characters from series that I rock with, analyze their character, their strengths, their weaknesses, and what potential they have story-wise. With the cross of Spider-Verse across theaters and media popping off, it's only appropriate to start off with the one who got his first movie appearance recently. Ben Riley was introduced in the 90s Spider-Man comics as his clone and would have a controversial history throughout this period and further down the line. Now, Spider-Man had a record of more than just one clone of himself and not just another variation of him. The first clone we would ever see would be in Spider-Man issue 149, where Jackal would create a clone of Peter with all of his memories and confusing the two. The two would be forced to fight each other here. The clone would die in the exchange. The issue would end with Peter dumping the clone where he felt would be most appropriate, where he would want to be disposed in a smokestack in the city to be incinerated. However, it's never really this simple in comics, so he had to come back and we needed to convolute this story. Turns out, the clone never got incinerated and made it out, and after a lot of time and depression and questioning his existence, he decided it would be best to pave his own road and take his own identity as Ben Riley. Now, Ben Riley's history and part in the Spider-Man mythos is probably the most complicated out of all the characters I'm gonna talk about. He honestly just deserves to have his own video, but for the sake of simplifying this, there was a lot of flip-flopping about Ben's role and whether or not he was the real clone or the original before retconned in itself, before dying, turning into dust, confirming that he was the clone, then coming back, and then coming back again, yeah, it gets weird. An issue with Ben is his personality is a bit weak. He's either always acting not really different from Peter, wimping for ages about being a clone and never moving on from that point, or kind of failing to grow into his own thing. Now before any Ben Riley fans come at me, think of every line of dialogue Ben has ever given before the newest stuff came out. His most powerful words and speeches. Nine times out of ten, Peter has either already said that or is exactly something Peter would say. However, a strong point of Ben is his ability to help out Peter when he needs it. Basically, Peter was at a dark point in his life and was being exclusively Spider-Man and rarely taking the suit off. He was angry, bitter, and tired of all the shit he'd been through, and when confronted by Ben, he lashed out and Ben would have to calm him down and remind him of who he is and let him know that Ben probably has it kinda worse. You know, with the whole I'm not even a real person thing. He would gladly take Peter's place for him due to that. Ben and Peter would work together and have a better relationship relationship like brothers, and Ben would even replace Peter outright while he did his own thing. But then he would die at the hands of Green Goblin and turn to dust, confirming that yes, he was the clone all along. Ben overall has a bit of an issue with his own personality and having it separate from Peter Parker, but we should still respect him in his own right for his history and the role he played, regardless of how controversial it may or may not have been. But I'm not going to talk about Ben without talking about the arguably better clone in Kane. Kane was the first actual clone of Peter. Wait, what? Despite being deformed and unstable when he was introduced, Kane had issues with Ben and would try framing him for murder, which would backfire and land on Peter instead. But Ben would take his place in court anyway so Peter could find and convince Kane to take the stand. But things would go south, and both Spider-Man and Kane would be forced into a different trial against Spider-Man, not Peter Parker. So as the trial against Peter with Ben taking the stand goes on, the mock trial against Spider-Man goes on as well with the jury being filled with Spider-Man's enemies. The trial of Peter Parker is worth the read if you're a fan of the three characters and wish to follow it closer. But the reason I bring it up is to show that in the beginning, Kane wanted to watch over Peter's life because he knew that he deserved the best outcome possible while ruining Ben's life. He had a really high regard for Peter and he viewed Ben as somebody who had no business being there to begin with. Long story short, Kane would go through a lot die, come back, become a tarantula, get cured, help Peter, dip like a chip, and take his own spider mantle in Texas? The thing with Kane is that with his older and modern version, it's clear how different he is from both Peter and Ben. Kane doesn't even want to do the heroing thing, but after he became his own Scarlet Spider, he was more of an anti-hero version of Spider-Man. He had no issues with killing, letting his aggression show, and being more ruthless towards his villains, like when he killed Doc Doc, Carnage, or Kraven. Both Scarlet Spiders have their arcs to tell but I appreciate Kane for having a completely different way he carries himself, even if one could just describe it as an edgelord. Shut up, it's different. Whew! Talking about these two is actually really rough. Ben and Kane have so much attached to them, like 
I've barely actually explored them because if I did, this video would be hours long. Maybe one day I'll review these guys' story more, but for now, I hope I've given at least a decent summary of Ben and Kane's personalities and a piece of their storylines. Alright, I'm gonna give myself a little break and talk about a clone who's a lot easier to keep up with. Phase 4 is a clone of Kasumi. It's not really identified if she's an original clone, the clone who appears before or after Dead or Alive 5's event, but like Spider-Man, Kasumi also has a handful of clones, mostly irrelevant except for a few. Now I'm pretty sure Phase 4 is just meant to be false Kasumi as it's implied throughout, but never specifically stated, especially since in the next game there's multiple Phase 4s because we don't know who else Kasumi should fight in her story yet. False Kasumi is introduced in Dead or Alive 5 story, presumably as Kasumi herself with all of her memories. She joins in and only wants to find and kill Alpha 152, the most dangerous clone of Kasumi, who was introduced in the previous game. For context, in this series there's a corporation called Doatech who's been messing around with some of the cast of characters for a while, and had been the creation of so many Kasumi clones rying around. In DOA 4, Doatech would be burned down by the ninja cast and Alpha would somehow survive this, and Kasumi just wants to get rid of her. Without going too in-depth on this plot point and its flaws and potentials, in a nutshell, Hayate and Ayane, Kasumi's brother and sister, recognize that this is false Kasumi, I guess, and make it their job to hunt her down and kill her, as she tries to take down the remains of Doatech. All the while, the real Kasumi Kasumi happens to just be laying around doing nothing at home until the very end of the game. The two ninja pricks pick off false Kasumi and kill her with no problems, other than the fact that this version of Kasumi did nothing wrong, as well as is scarred for life since her own brother and sister just killed her for no reason. Even when Hayabusa, the most stoic of them, arrives late to the scene, he even goes, damn, kinda bogus. Now there is a scene in the beginning of the game where Phase 4, False Kasumi, is standing on destruction of unnamed city wherever, implying that she caused the bad bad stuff stuff, but it's such an odd way to convey a narrative. Dead or Alive tends to be too vague with some of its really, really important story elements, and if you want to get a good picture and gist of events, you'll want to play DOA Dimensions, which gives a solid recaps of things leading up to DOA 4, minus some weird retcons. This plot point is hands down the biggest flaw of DOA. DOA 5 story, it makes me upset because it seems like no one really cares about the fact that this was really messed up. Even if these two somehow knew this wasn't actually Kasumi, from the perspective of Ayane and Hayate, why do this? Is it because you hate Doatech so bad that this feels worthwhile to get back just out of spite? Is it because Kasumi ran away to get vengeance on your behalf and you're still holding a grudge over it? Even if it's not really her, it's your sister for Christ's sake, does this really not bother you at all? Well that's the life of a Stone Cold Ninja, it ain't easy, bro. So living as a Stone Cold Ninja means you have to be a complete ass for little or no reason, even to your own kind? It'd be different if the game itself at least acknowledges how bad this is, but it doesn't. Even if False Kasumi destroyed this city, who cares? If there's some imbalance to her good and bad side, why can't we just talk to her? She's clearly mostly aligned with good, and I'm pretty sure there's other paths we can take besides just kill first, ask questions later. DOA has a natural fighting game first world problem, where the game feels the need to have the story work around gameplay circumstances and events instead of the the other way around, leading to fights that arguably shouldn't even occur or have questionable outcomes to say the least. Just like Mortal Kombat. Hey, hey, hey you gotta give me credit, that was a really clean segue to Melina. Okay, this is kind of rough, because for whatever reason, Mortal Kombat felt the need to apply two reboots to their canonical lore where the timeline is restarted. They do this twice, you guys, which leaves me with a total of three different Melinas to work with, each from three different timelines. I actually had to rewrite this whole part of the video because I realized just sitting here summarizing each Melina, then going back to talk about them would have been worse than just doing it as I go. So I'll just start like this. If I were to rank all these three Melinas, it would be first timeline Melina at first place, third timeline Melina goes to second place, and second timeline Melina goes in third place. The reason first timeline Melina works best is because her motivation adds up the hardest and her progression with her persona is pretty much peak. Now the first timeline has a big flaw if you ask me. Characters don't have fulfilling impactful moments that are easy to connect to. You have to do that work on your own in order to make connections. 
The first timeline focuses on telling you the things that happened rather than showing you. This is a problem because if introduced to a character who simply rendered as hard exposition with no emotional impact to their past and all foreshadowed and forced into their present, it's harder for your overall audience to care about said character unless they go out of their way to do so, which would tend to involve making unstated assumptions. Picture it like this, if you didn't see those flashbacks for Jinx's early life and instead were just given a bio about her on a Twitter thread and it was barely explored upon in Arcane, would that help her character or degrade it? I wouldn't know because I didn't watch the show. Still, it contributes hard to a lack of exposition. Perfect example. Melina and Katana are sisters working for Shao Kahn. However, Katana finds out that Melina isn't her sister and is actually a clone who was meant to replace her, but instead watches over her now. Problem is, we don't know how Katana found out about this, let alone the impact it has on her. We have to assume. But this is a big factor we don't get, and it's pretty much the base point of Katana's character. If she never found out, why would she turn face? Regardless, Melina has an overrated, one-sided rivalry with Katana throughout. When Shao Kahn dies, Melina aids multiple villains, one of them being Onaga, who happens to take control of Katana, allowing Melina to take Katana's role and rule over Outworld, at least until Shao Kahn comes back and Melina has to work with him again. The reason this works more despite its flaws is that this is the only version of Melina out of the three who one, actually accomplishes something, and two, has motivations that add up. Melina had nothing on her mind other than doing whatever Shao Kahn wanted until things boiled over to allow Melina a taste of the throne life, but it was taken away so quickly, and her goal is now naturally changed from aiding Shao Kahn, to killing Katana, to being a ruler herself. As for third timeline Melina, she's okay. Two steps forward, one step back from the last. Third timeline Melina is instead the biological older twin sister to Katana. Their dynamic is still a rivalry, kinda. In this timeline, despite it being restarted by what's his name, who made it a point to have this be the peaceful timeline, Douche King still ends up letting what was previously an outworld race be degraded into a disease. And <laughs> nice. So, Melina gets infected, which makes her mental instability worse, I guess? Ugh. It feels like the writers or whoever was in charge wanted to step away from the katana Melina rivalry thing, but also didn't really want to commit. This is a decent twist and neat setup despite the flaw but it's so poorly handled and has no closure to it whatsoever. Melina gets infected, has some sort of temporary agent to make it more of an on-off switch, and that's it. Which is why this Melina isn't great, but a step up from Melina of the last timeline, who is extremely inconsistent, as this version of Melina is supposed to be the exact same of the first timeline, yet altered primarily due to the time paradox MK shifted itself into. Long story short, when Mortal Kombat's timeline first restarted, it would be up to a specific point in the lore, meaning everything prior to it would remain the same. But this is thrown out the window instantly when you can point out the numerous consistency errors within the first timeline. For instance, instead of Melina and Katana working together from Jump, Katana and Jade are working together for Shao Kahn. This effectively erases the rivalry between sisters, but in fairness, given the fact that this only benefited Katana's character and not Melina, it's not that bad, but it's still a consistency error. Other than that, there's really nothing to praise for second timeline Melina. This version of her effectively does nothing. She's found by this version of Katana, which leads to her finding out about her past, which I guess works better than us not knowing how she finds out. Melina then can't do a damn thing for Shao Kahn. She has a small rivalry with Kotal Kahn that ends off in the same game it's introduced in, and then she dies as a result of it, and that's it. Now, Melina does come back in MK11 after this, but not in any of the canonical story events of said game, so there's no point of even bringing her up. Like I said, this chart says it all about Melina. Okay, last clony we're gonna talk about. Remember Gemini Man? I do, and the only reason I do is because I like the action scenes more than literally anyone else. So Henry is our 700th cool Will Smith character played by Will Smith, who is an assassin who's really good at what he does. So good that his mentor and the wacky corp he works with is so wacky that they clone him and make a clone called Junior. That That's it, That that's the plot. Okay, so, Henry is getting older and genuinely tired of all the killing and plans to retire soon. However, the agency he's working with turns out to try to kill him and replace him with the younger version of himself, also sent to kill him. Did I show you a picture of me? Yeah, you look old. Yeah, he also looks just like you. Did that never cross your mind somehow? Whatever. 
This movie draws to the point that these two are one and the same, a lot, which is fine and even better given that they act like two different people at the same time. Both raised in the same conditions of always having to train with an elite force on top of being trained and guided by the same guy. Henry is an old killer who doesn't want to do it anymore. Junior is athletic, skilled, and always ready for the action and to follow orders with his youth and training. Another thing I like about Junior is that when he's initially confronted with the truth about being a clone, he naturally and violently denies it, freaking out before even getting more confirmation. It takes a toll on him, but revealing the truth was enough for him to switch sides and go against the people who trained him, cutting ties and later on being able to pursue a life of his own. Junior gets a big personality gap that's established as his own. And guess what? That's not only the best attribute of Junior, but of all the characters I've mentioned. Clone characters are admired because of many reasons. Hell, sometimes we don't even know why we like some of them, we just do. It can't be helped. But the best representation of these characters is their growth from what they're based upon. The same growth that may or may not feel lacking from their original counterparts to some people. But best of all, these guys work because despite being exactly the same, they're so different. People got tired of seeing Peter in a worse mental state, which is why when Ben came around it felt like a breath of fresh air, even if he was exactly the same as what we had before. Melina offers a good counterbalance to Katana. While the rivalry is boring and one-sided, Melina works because the best version of her comes from practically nothing to gaining everything, even if it's handed to her by being a pretender, and it further fuels her drive to want so much more for herself. We call this character development. Rivalries are never really handled well in the Dead or Alive franchise, and there's nothing truly compelling or complex or morally questionable about certain characters that actually give a challenge to their rival, let alone pay off. Phase 4 could be that for Kasumi. Clone characters are appreciated because when they work and are handled well, we can't help but naturally gravitate toward them. They have the common struggle of not being a real person, but it's so satisfying to see them break out of that and have an identity of their own, separate from who they were based upon. The ones I mentioned here are probably the shining examples of how these kinds of characters should be handled. I'm sure some pricks are gonna yell at me for not bringing up other clone characters in media, but I really don't care. If you're having a clone character, don't let them be one note or sidelined, especially if said clone is based on one of your major or main characters. Let the clone be the clone, but also let them learn and grow to be themselves, to have their own identity.